Hello everyone, warm welcome again from Kuala Lumpur to this ABU World Dev three-part webinar series on DAB plus digital radio technology implementation and rollout. The series so far dealt with the current status of DAB plus digital radio technology, business case, DAB receivers, hidden systems, and sharing of some experiences of DAB plus trial implementation. Uh, before we begin uh, today's presentation, just a short housekeeping announcement. Uh, a quick note on using the webinar control panel to send in your question, as you can see on the slide. Please type a question in the Q&A tab and keep sending them to us as and when you have them. We'll take the questions at the end during Q&A session. And finally, for your information, we'll email you a link to download the presentation slides. Uh, today is the third and final day on this series. Uh, we have presentations on transmission systems and RF network uh, design and modeling. Uh, for further program highlights uh, and uh, the presentations, uh, Dr. Les Sabel will take the control from now on. Um, over to you, Les. Thank you, Shree. Uh, that's great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending again. Uh, or if you haven't before, thank you for attending today. Uh, it's all, you know, let me just turn that speaker off. There we go. Um, so today we have a, a great session on transmission, um, both transmission systems and uh, RF planning. Uh, and we're going to end up talking about the uh, New World Dab Technical Group in the Asia Pacific. Um, we will have some time for questions today and we won't be going over time like we have the last few days. So please get your questions in as Shri indicated. Uh, but as for now, I think we'll kick off. Um, so we have only two speakers today. That is myself and Rich Redman. Rich Redman has a video about Gates Air Transmitters that I'll play for you uh, after my initial presentation. So at this point, um, let's go to the first presentation. Thank you. So we're going to talk about transmission system overview and monitoring systems in this, uh, this session. So let's start off with the transmission system overview. And this, this will fit into uh, what Rich Redmond will say afterwards. So the main system blocks, you know, we start with the EMUX. We heard a lot about that, that yesterday from uh, LP, from Panita. Uh, and we feed an ETI stream uh, somehow to a transmitter and that transmitter then produces the RF output signal which goes into either a filter or a combiner uh, and then onto an antenna switch frame if we have a large antenna which has two sections it, there may not be a switch frame and of course um, if we have more than one transmitter uh, such as we have in Sydney we have three ensembles uh, we need a combiner system we'll talk a bit more about those as well so let's have a look at distribution first. Here we go. Here's a picture of what the ABC SBS network looked like when initially designed 10 years ago. Uh, it's a little different today because they've changed some of their topology, but uh, essentially it is still very similar. And what we have is a number of studios at the top and on the left-hand side, the ones at the top and the bottom actually, feed encoded audio into two main multiplexer sites. So it's a, a dual hot redundant ensemble multiplexing system. So it's always hot and it's a matter of the, the transmitters, which we can see on the right hand side here, selecting the appropriate input and then putting that to air. And the appropriate input is usually you know, the uh, the, what we call the main most of the time and that will monitor for errors if, if it fails it will switch to the alternate transmitter 
And what's often done these days is those transmitters will be swapped over uh, every few months. So each transmitter has a similar uptime. But you can see in this case, there's five transmission sites, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven studio sites. So it's quite, quite a complex network uh, that operates in a, uh, a semi-mesh sort of architecture. So let's look at the modulation encoding and where that occurs. So the audio encoding sits outside. That's the first part of the operation, uh, feeding the signal. Um, the audio encoder does the audio encoding. It will do an, a DAB plus HEAAC version two encoding. Uh, what happens in the multiplexer is that encoded bitstream is wrapped in Reed Solomon error correcting code, the outer code, and also some virtual time interleaving is applied to uh, empower that uh, that block code that makes it more uh, effective. Uh, and that happens in the Emux. Uh, and then the signal is actually put into an ETI stream by the multiplexer. All the other audio encoders are multiplexed together into that ETI stream, which is often then an EDI, and sent to the to the, the transmitter at the transmitter site. And that is the transmitter's exciter is what does all of the signal processing itself. So it actually does the error correcting code, the, the, um, the convolutional code, it does the time interleaving, it puts all the services together, uh, does the frequency interleaving, the modulation itself, the OFDM, and that goes to the transmitter's power amplifiers. So the point of this is that the, is the exciter in the transmitter actually does play a very big role in the transmission signal processing. We talked but then about forward error correcting codes, that outer code, the, the convolutional code. And in DAB plus we have uh, essentially five selections we can have. They're the main ones. Uh, what we usually use is what's called FEC code rate 3A. It's a it, sorry, code 3A, EEP 3A. Uh, equal error protection, that means, and that is a half rate code. And that is seen as giving the best trade off between coverage and capacity. So we can increase the coverage by having a stronger code. We can go to code rate 1A, which is a quarter rate code. That means it's only one bit out of four is actually traffic. Uh, and that has, you can see, a capacity of only 576 kilobits, so it's half that of 3A. But the important thing here is when you use that, if you can use that, the power required to cover the coverage area is between 3 and 6 dB less than a code rate 3A. So between half and a quarter. And that the difference depends on the type of terrain. If you've got flat terrain, you'd be able to use a quarter of the power. If you've got undulating terrain with more shadowed pockets, maybe a half of that order. And we can go the other direction as well. We can have weaker coding, say 4A at uh, rate three quarter code, where three out of four bits is, is traffic. And that gives us an extra 576 kilobits, so 1728, or effectively 2764 kilobits channels. But to get the same coverage area as 3A, we need twice, sorry, four times the power, four times the power. So not 10 kilowatts, it's 40 kilowatts. Now, the very important thing here is each of these, each of the services that or sub channels that is transmitted can have its own code. So you can have, <coughs> most of the services on 3A, and if you're a bit stuck for capacity in um, by one provider, they can pick 3B or 4A. 
so that they can get additional services in the capacity they're allocated. Now, the important thing with these code rates, you can see the A rates and 1B rate. A rates can be configured in sub-channel rates of 8 kilobits per second. So typically 32 is the minimum we'll use, 32, 40, 48, 56 and so forth, 64. Whereas the B rate codes can only can be configured in 32 kilobit blocks, so 32, 64 and so on. So signal flow, and here's some uh, examples of, and of different channels, it's called here. They're actually ensembles, they go to different combiner modules to be all combined together on the associated frequency block with our patch panel and our uh, antenna on its tower. And we see a couple of examples of such combiners on the right. They, they can be quite chunky beasts, they're generally cavity type filter uh, construction, so they're very efficient. Typical insertion losses, you know, around 1 dB, uh, maybe a little bit less. But of course, if you're the first one in, you have to go, might have to go to, through two or three combiner modules. So you might end up with uh, 3 dB of loss. So the first guy in might have to have almost twice the power of the last one. So important to remember that if you're in a multi-ensemble situation. Uh, one of the really good things about the way DAB is designed is the OFDM. And OFDM is quite spectrally efficient in terms of not only having you know, the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, but the fact that you can get frequency blocks very close to each other, or the or the guard band, the frequency guard band, very close to each other. And we can see here what you do with the filter. A typical OFDM signal will have a noise floor somewhere down around about 40 dB down. So this is all the residual carrier uh, sidebands from each of the individual carriers. Uh, and what we need to do though is to get it down to uh, a shoulder distance of 80. And to do that, we use those critical mass filters uh, or combiners, depending on the situation that's needed. And that allows us to fit, sorry, here's an example of the loss in a typical filter system. This is from Spinner, and you can see here examples, and typical insertion loss uh, is 1.3 dB. 1 to 1.3. So the, the very critical thing here is about these filters is that using this we can get DAB within 1.712 megahertz frequency blocks when the signal is 1.536 megahertz. So the actual guard interval is you know, a bit over 150 megahertz. Uh, uh, kilohertz. So it's very spectrally efficient. It's only about a, less than a tenth, about a tenth of the actual signal is spent in frequency guard band. This is one of the reasons why it's also very popular in mobile communications and was adopted in uh, fourth generation mobile and continues to be in fifth. Okay, look at uh, towers or, or transmitter sites. And we have high power, high tower systems. And that, that's a couple of examples there. These are typically around 200 meter towers uh, and host multiple antennas. Uh, the one on the left is in Sydney. The one on the right is in Mount Wellington in Tasmania, uh, which gets extremely cold and very difficult conditions, uh, especially in winter. So it's got a radome, whereas the one in Sydney doesn't need a radome. We just get wet, we don't get that cold and freezing. Another thing you can do here for efficiency of aperture, because aperture on towers is very expensive, particularly in city areas. And we had the situation in Australia where we use um, VHF band three for 
digital television as well as digital radio. So what we had to do is we had to share the panels uh, between vertically polarised DAB and horizontally polarised TV. And you can see here a picture on the left hand side uh, of a tower in uh, that's Adelaide, I think. And you can see these white dots and you can see they're, they're, the, they're the dipoles on the, on the panels. So the vertical dipoles are for, for DAB and the horizontal ones are for television. And that way we save half the space. We or we don't have to build another tower, even more importantly, because people don't like lots of towers everywhere, especially 200 metre ones. Now, ant antenna patterns. Uh, and particularly with the sort of arrays I've just been talking about and four panel arrays, uh, sometimes we need to protect <coughs> certain directions. And here's an example of that. This is Brisbane, uh, the original design. And there was protection that was required in multiple directions. The dig notch in the north, that was to protect uh, analog television, which was still being turned off at the time that we put this on. Um, and then some of these other notches here, uh, that was to the north of Brisbane to Wide Bay. And then this notch is to protect the Gold Coast. And this notch is to protect Ipswich, which is an adjacent license area. Now, since this was built, this has been uh, uh, debated on the update of this. And that debate still goes on because um, protection and overspill are very hot topics in the radio world. So we have to always remember that when we're designing an antenna and the, the, the HRP and the VRP, that we always have to consider interference to other areas as well as the coverage we're going to get. And we'll, get it, we'll come across this again uh, in the session after Rich when we talk about RF coverage and interference. Now we also have medium power or low power transmissions. Um, while in Australia our main capital cities are 50 kilowatt ERPs, uh, in Europe it's typically main sites are 5 to 10 kilowatts. Uh, they're more closely spaced. The license areas are smaller, so you don't need as much power. Uh, so they're the medium power transmissions and repeaters and infill sites can be anywhere between 100 watts and 5 kilowatts. The ones we have in Sydney are uh, only up to 500 watts. We'll talk about that a bit more. And they are big panel arrays like we just saw. Uh, they're typically maybe two to six bay dipole arrays. And for some repeaters, they might actually even use Yagis. They have better gain, more directionality, so we can target the, the signal power into the right area. So that's just an overview of transmission systems in the various parts. Let's just now just talk a little bit about control, uh, control and monitoring. So first of all, let's go look at all the different parts in our transmission system. We go from our studio into some multiplexing equipment. It might be a studio multiplex and then to an ensemble multiplex. And then we get to a transmitter system and the transmitter uh, tower and antenna itself. And that signal is then radiated out to our listeners. Um, it might go to additional uh, repeater sites. It would be monitored by some sort of network management system, which will look at uh, things like an ETI or EDI monitor. Uh, so it's monitoring the output of the multiplex uh, before it goes into the transmitter. It looks at the output of the transmitter to determine and, and monitor the quality of the signal. Uh, one thing we've found certainly in the transmitters we used here in Australia, that the exciters tend to degrade. There's some parts in, um, in the exciter which lose stability and the modulation error ratio tends to degrade over time. For DAB, we don't really want to see the MER go below about 25 dB. Yeah, we can run it at 30, 35, that's you know, super superb. Uh, and that's what you need for DTV, running high order modulations like 
256 clam, but you don't need that level of accuracy for QPSK. So 25 is great, but if we start getting down to below 20 dB, um, we are starting to see uh, the effects of the noise floor uh, of the transmitted signal. And that, if it gets down to 15, we'll definitely see uh, an impact on the coverage area and the fringe areas uh, of, you know, the, at, the, at the most distant reception points will start to degrade. Uh, we can use field monitors to monitor that uh, and single frequency network monitors to monitor uh, and ensure that all the repeaters in a, in a single frequency network are time aligned. And in the studio, of course, we want to make sure that what we've got off air is what we're putting to air so we can have a service monitor. And many countries, including Australia, require an ensemble recorder, which uh, records uh, 60 days in our case, just in case someone says something wrong and it has to be checked. Or maybe you, uh, you're advertising, you want to make sure your spots went to air correctly. There's a whole range of ways. You might even want to reuse some of that content. So we have this whole network of monitoring equipment to make sure our system keeps operating. And often these network management systems are located in central points uh, and we have monitoring uh, providers here in this country and overseas which monitor multiple networks at the same time. They're very used to what is needed and they can enact um, teams to restore faults very quickly. And often these systems are accompanied by mnemonic panels. We can see here one of the transmission system where you've got the main mux feeding some DAs. This is in the days of ETI over coax uh, rather than EDI over IP uh, with the changeover switches into different exciters and eventually out to the power amplifier. So these sort of mnemonic displays are very good for indicating errors and faults very easily. And you can quickly zoom in on what the problem is. So in summary, uh, transmission systems need to be engineered to meet the business demands for coverage and interference, for reliability, and of course, performance and cost effectiveness. There's a lot of parameters there. And I always say, uh, take the time to do the design because you get the design right, you will most likely save yourself a fair bit of money in the long term. And that particularly goes for coverage. If you use modern tools for coverage, uh, you'll get the right size transmitter, not oversized or undersized. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. And of course, we need to monitor the system to ensure the appropriate reliability. We can detect faults and re recover from them. Um, we can update features and future proof your business, basically. So hopefully that has been of some use. I thank you for that. And what I'm going to now do is uh, move on to Rich Redman, who's the uh, President International of Gates Air International. Um, and he, he used to travel the world extensively, but now he's uh, uh, in Ohio, I think, at the moment. Um, so he had to send his presentation because uh, it's the wrong time of the day by video. So I'll now show you the video from Rich Redmond uh, all about transmitters, how modern transmitters are constructed, what they can do, and some of the newer models which are coming out, uh, particularly for repeaters. So um, I'm now going to start that video. And here we go. Over to Rich. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the World DAB uh, webinar series. We'll be talking today about uh, advances in DAB transmission systems. My name is Rich Redmond from Gates Air. Uh, glad to uh, participate, and uh, thanks everyone for making time uh, to discuss DAB transmission. So for today, uh, the agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the transmitter options for DAB networks from very low power transmitters to much higher power transmitters. We'll talk about advancements in energy efficiency uh, that have taken place over time and, uh, and why that's relevant to us. 
look at the considerations of where you might use a liquid or air cooled transmitter in your network because the applications are, are pretty different. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the redundancy operations uh, that you can choose. Uh, so these could be both the redundancies that are built into a regular transmitter uh, and then some of the configurations you might be able to use to back up your system or multiple systems. And we'll also talk a little bit about link redundancy type of redundant options you might have in an IP network, for example. And then, you know, a lot of times we think of transmitter sites being uh, one transmitter for one channel. That's traditionally been the way an analog system works. DAB uh, in its nature is a, a multi audio channel or, or video channel if it's DMB um, uh, per transmitter. And so we have some solutions that actually go beyond that, and we'll talk about how we might have a multi-transmitter system or multi-carriers on the same transmitter. Uh, so to start, if we just think a little bit about the structure of a DAB network, uh, you know, kind of in a signal flow from left to right, you know, and others will be talking about these other uh, portions of the signal flow. Uh, but there's multiple audio sources through encoding and multiplexing that gets distributed, at least on an IP network over e, uh, EDI protocol. Uh, and then we can accept that natively in the transmitter. So if we think of this signal flow, the area we're going to talk about is going to be uh, on the right hand side. So transmitters, uh, typically we think of them uh, somewhat by the power level and also by the cooling methodology. Here's an example in the Gates Air uh, product portfolio. Uh, other manufacturers would have some similar characteristics, but at very low powers, they're usually a very compact uh, transmitter solution, maybe uh, 50 to 150 watts. Uh, mid power transmitters we might see in the several hundred watts to kilowatt range. These are all typically air cooled. Uh, in this portfolio, we go up to a, a fairly high power level, 13 kilowatts in um, uh, in digital power uh, in air. And then liquid cooling uh, starts a little over a kilowatt uh, and can go to very high power levels with multiple cabinets of about 45 kilowatts. So we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, as we go through the portfolio. When I think about uh, DAV uh, transmitters, especially the ones that are probably most common in most networks, very compact. Uh, some unique advances, uh, high efficiency Doherty PAs. Doherty's uh, amplification methodology that allows uh, amplifiers to be far more efficient than you know where we were even four or five years ago. Uh, contemporary transmitters also have native EDI or IP based inputs uh, for the ensemble transport stream. Now, the traditional ETI or physical layer is also available. In, in our case, we have some uh, replaceable uh, front panel modules that allow you to choose what type of input uh, facilities that you have. Uh, transmitters have adaptive uh, pre-correction built in or RTAC in our case, uh, real-time adaptive correction, and we can achieve very high MER ratings, 33 uh, dB. Now, it's important to note especially if you're comparing to a lot of television uh, nomenclature. Uh, MER, uh, because the DAB waveform is, is very, very robust and much simpler than that of, say, DVB-T2, an MER of 25 or 27 is actually quite good. And increasing it above, you know, in the 30s, while it does give you some improvement, uh, it doesn't give you the same level of improvement you might have in television. So when doing your network planning, uh, you know, the trade off of transmitter efficiency and size uh, versus MER is one that uh, MER doesn't need to be generally protected as much as it might be in television. Now, in our systems, these transmitters can be configured in multiple ways as a transmitter, and so that's defined as taking a transport stream in, an on channel gap filler, meaning I take frequency one in and then I rebroadcast it on the same frequency to be used in an SFN, so it's off air pickup and then a rebroadcasting or a transposer. I come in on frequency one and I transpose it to frequency two. Uh, and the other thing we'll talk a little bit about is all of these need to have a very modular and simple plug-in power supplies and PAs. Uh, this is an advance that um, uh, you'll see in some of the products, uh, specifically the ones we offer. Now to give you an idea of power levels, again, 
in these very compact transmitters. So in one RU, uh, you know, market leading products will deliver 80 to 150 watts, uh, depending on the amplifier selected. Uh, in two rack units, you know, upwards of 450 watts, and in three rack units, 750 watts. Now this is a significant advancement. Uh, one as compared to where uh, state-of-the-art products were five or, or seven years ago. So if you've got a network uh, that may have been deployed in the past 10 years, there have been significant advancements in the ability to make compact and high efficient solutions. Um, uh, but even when you look between competitors, not everyone offers very compact solutions. Now, uh, where this can really benefit you is when you're paying for the amount of space you consume at a transmitter site, uh, having compact transmitters allows you to save money on your uh, network deployment costs. So if we zoom in a little bit closer on what you might see in a contemporary transmitter, as I mentioned before, uh, it's all about modularity. So in this product, we can see there's multiple input slots where we can take uh, ETI or EDI in. We also have uh, off-air receivers for the transposer, and we have satellite receivers to directly feed the transmitter. Front panel touchscreen for control, Ethernet uh, port uh, to go to a um, TCP IP based uh, uh, web browser and SNMP uh, protocol. And then when we look at the rear, all the typical connections you would expect with RF out inputs for GPS with one PPS uh, connections, uh, cooling fans, which are removable and replaceable from the back without having to turn the transmitter off. Uh, and all of these are modular and simple to replace. Now I mentioned these multiple slots. Uh, in this product, for example, from Gates Air, uh, this allows you to have a number of options. So you could have two ETIs and two EDIs, which allows you to mix and match the type of transport stream for streamless switching and automatic failover. They could be uh, all ETIs, if that's uh, what you wanted, up to four uh, for for substantially more a path redundancy. Uh, or in the case of RFN, we could come in for a gap fillers and transposers. So these, these same products just have mix and match modules, which allow you to have commonality of spares, which makes it um, uh, much more flexible. Now, when we look inside the transmitter, uh, you know, probably the first thing you'll notice is a real lack of cables. So while there are a couple that take a sample to the back, they're contained within the RF power module. So the fins you see, the heat sink, uh, that's the RF power amplifier module. It's removable from the back by simply removing a few screws, as is the power supply uh, and the GPS module. Uh, all the boards simply plug together and uh, uh, make it for very easy uh, field replacement, very rapid repair. And so that's uh, something that's important to look at in uh, transmitters of contemporary design. Now, as we start to go up in power level, uh, what we're going to see is the same architecture uh, simply scales up. So we use the same low power units as drivers. They drive larger amplifiers, which uh, uh, could give you up to 1.2 kilowatts in about four rack units or nearly two kilowatts in about four and a half. Now these amplifier uh, chassis uh, can be put in a rack uh, together and we can reach uh, up to uh, 13 kilowatts. So if, you know, in some parts of the world, DAB runs fewer but very high power sites. This is common, for example, in Australia. And so this is a product a platform that works very well uh, in, that, um, in that architecture. Now here's a block diagram of uh, uh, this network topology. So if we look, the red lines represent a uh, transport stream. So that's the ETI or EDI coming into the exciters. The green uh, represents control. Uh, and then uh, the blue is RF. So these are passively combined uh, multiple amplifiers out to a common antenna. Uh, Real-time adaptive correction sample ports, both pre and post filter. Uh, and then uh, a fully modular architecture. So not only can the modules be swapped out uh, while they're hot, the power supplies can also be swapped out. Now, when we talk about liquid cooling, a uh, similar architecture, uh, high efficiency. So all of these use Doherty uh, amplification from the very low power, which is unique to the products the, that 
we're showing you today uh, through higher power and that it's broadband, meaning there are no jumpers or tuning to do to go from say channel uh, 9A to moving to 12B. Uh, it's, it's all the same palette. Now, you know, key characteristics in liquid cooling is making sure that not only do we have high efficiency uh, amplifiers, we need high efficiency power supplies, uh, low power consumption of uh, pumps and heat exchangers, and a significant amount of redundancy uh, uh, throughout the system. And we'll take a look at what that architecture uh, uh, looks like a bit. So in these cases, in contemporary designs, a uh, full cabinet can be very uh, power dense. Uh, nearly 15 uh, and a half kilowatts is uh, the power level available in one rack. Uh, uh, downwards, uh, you know, to a couple kilowatts. Uh, and so the modules are all hot pluggable and removable. They go to a common um, a heat exchanger and pumps. Now it's also important to note, and this is the case in both the air cooled and liquid cooled. To the right, you see kind of this a chart with PS1, PS2, and PS3. Uh, in this architecture and in, in contemporary designs, you'll have multiple power supplies. Uh, somewhat unique to the ones we're showing you. Uh, we have N plus one power supply redundancy. So if you lose a supply, you're still at 100%, or if you lose two supplies, you're at 50% uh, power. And those power supplies are hot pluggable and removable, which is uh, something to really understand. Some places you have to send it back to the factory uh, for repair. Now the pumps, uh, you know, in a contemporary design, they can be located in the transmitter cabinet. They're very compact and uh, low energy consumption. We'd see these are uh, uh, connected using stainless uh, uh, piping and uh, brackets, appropriate shutoff valves and gauges and so forth um, that we would see that uh, has dual redundant pumps uh, so that either pump could carry the load. Uh, we also have a, a reservoir, a refilling system. So as you know, in some cases, you've got uh, little bits of coolant that uh, evaporate out of the system. Uh, in a contemporary design, specifically the ones we're showing you, having a reservoir allows you to have uh, some, even though it's a closed loop system, uh, so it's not just like a, a big container that uh, fluid is in, it's actually pressurized and closed. Uh, but having a reservoir system allows it to refill that uh, so that you uh, reduce your maintenance. Now, heat exchangers, uh, you know, some uh, for some products can be very large, uh, but, you know, as I mentioned, space is a premium in a transmitter site. So reducing the footprint's a good way to save on your uh, operational costs. Now, in this case, we see a couple different versions uh, dependent upon how much power you're running, uh, both with redundant fans. Uh, so the smaller ones about 60 by 80 centimeters, the larger ones about 70 by 96. So uh, as you can see, very, very compact. They can be mounted vertically or horizontally. Now, one thing that's quite unique in, uh, in the system we offer is there's a programmable auto reversing that uh, periodically will uh, change the airflow to uh, dislodge any debris that might get pulled in. So if you think of pollen and weeds and leaves and things like that, which, you know, Normally, you'd have to go to your transmitter site to make sure the heat exchanger is clean. Uh, this auto reversing allows them to be dislodged early, uh, you know, once an hour, a couple times a day uh, by reversing the airflow. Uh, it will uh, clear that and help keep your um, system uh, clean and operating uh, very efficiently. Now, when we talk about efficiency, uh, you know, just as a refresher, we usually think of power efficiency. So the amount of energy I consume into the transmitter, RF out, and then the rest goes to waste heat. So, you know, if it was 100% efficient, if I put one kilowatt in, I'd get one kilowatt out. Most transmitters are nowhere near that efficient. Uh, and so that's why uh, the reduction of uh, waste energy is important. Not only just because it's uh, a, pri you know, we, we all wanna be efficient, use resources wisely, but uh, energy costs are not inexpensive. So, you know, if we look across Europe and uh, the United States, uh, you know, average energy cost is nearly 10 cents uh, a kilowatt hour. Uh, and, you know, when we have hundreds of transmitters across a network um, running 24 seven, that all adds up. Now, if I think a little bit about transmitter efficiency, you know, uh, there are some major drivers, uh, but we need to think 
uh, first, there are some things that we think of as fixed loss. The control system, whether you're controlling a very high power transmitter or a low power transmitter, consumes about the same amount of energy. Similar, the exciter or modulator consumes about the same amount of energy. So in a very a large transmitter, it's a very small contributor. In a small transmitter, uh, the control system and exciter is a much bigger uh, piece of it. But uh, that being said, the biggest drivers for energy consumption are the PA modules, the amplifiers. What efficiency level do they run at? Any drivers that might be used uh, or, or IPAs in some cases that are referred to. The cooling system, what type of fans and pumps are used? Are they speed controls? And then power supplies, uh, and that can make a big difference. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and as I kind of alluded to before, uh, generally low power transmitters as a percentage of efficiency are much uh, lower efficiency or somewhat lower than high power because these fixed uh, losses, such as the control system, the exciter and so forth, um, are a much larger part portion. So as you might imagine, uh, for a 10 watt transmitter, the energy consumption is dominated by the exciter. Uh, for a 10 kilowatt transmitter, it's a very small portion. Now, uh, I mentioned efficiency drivers, uh, you know, power amplifiers to give you some idea. You know, designs that were new five or six years ago could give you a PA efficiency between 23 to 33 percent, which equated in an overall transmitter efficiency of less than 27 percent, as low as 16. Now, today's designs, it's not uncommon to have Doherty amplification with PA efficiency in excess of 50 percent. And the overall transmitter efficiency is greater than 40 or 45 percent. Uh, so, so power amplifiers, probably the number one contributor. Number two is power supplies. So not that long ago, 86 percent was state of the art efficiency. Uh, today, over the past several years, uh, using some uh, you know, power supplies that we pioneered into the broadcast space, we can achieve 96 percent AC to DC efficiency. And in a minute, I'll give you an example of how that can make a pretty big impact in the transmitter. Uh, and then cooling systems, you know, having uh, the right size pumps and uh, blowers with the heat exchangers uh, really allow you to have uh, the best energy efficiency solution. So I think about power supply efficiency. Uh, if we look at the first yellow line, that's indicating the different efficiency of power supplies. So each of these columns talks about an overall transmitter's efficiency. And the bottom yellow line uh, looks at the overall transmitter efficiency. So all the other values remain equal. The, the same uh, uh, performance of the uh, RF amplifiers and control system. Simply going from 86% to 96% on the power supplies take us from a 34% or overall efficiency to 41%. So this is really important to evaluate when you're looking at transmitters. Now, sometimes it's hard to get independent data on that. Uh, some suppliers build their own uh, bespoke power supplies and it's hard to get uh, separate data. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you work with your suppliers and ask those questions, uh, it's a good place to start. In these cases, they're hot pluggable, easily removable supplies. These are made by uh, GE. Uh, they're available off the shelf um, and they're available in virtually every country around the world. Uh, very, very efficient. Now, all this drives what we call total cost of ownership, TCO, and that's kind of how you make a lot of your decisions about what size transmitter and your transmitter investments. So when we think about that, uh, these energy costs all drive into uh, the cost of not only the different parts of the system that convert energy into heat, uh, but then when we think about uh, all the different things that drive into the total cost of ownership, sometimes it's easy to get focused on purchase price but the cost of delivery, how easy it is to install and commission, training, these energy costs we discussed, repairs, upgrade, disposal costs, all of those goes into you know, how you decide what makes the most sense for you over the lifetime. Now, when we think about using a total cost of ownership, and before I mentioned liquid versus air cooling, uh, using a, a TCO or, or a total cost of ownership uh, calculator, we're able to compare a break-even analysis, if you will, of say an air-cooled versus liquid-cooled transmitter. In this case, we take into account, uh, you know, all the different costs associated with it, the energy efficiency, and then also uh, the amount of energy you consume uh, to evacuate the heat. So, 
if you were looking at transmitters in um, in lower power levels, typically below one kilowatt, air cooled is the dominant method uh, because the complexity of liquid cooling, uh, there's really not that much heat for it to extract out of the building, and it's hard to get the payoff for for higher power levels. Liquid cooling uh, works quite well. Redundancy options, so one plus one redundancy means main alternate transmitters. I have an exact duplicate. N plus one redundancy is shown in this drawing, says maybe I have three multiplexes with transmitters A, B, and C, and I have a shared transmitter that could be switched to any one of these A, B, or C multiplexes. The frequency changed, the program input would be changed, and that way I'm able to share my uh, redundancy costs uh, across a whole group of, uh, of uh, multiplexes uh, versus having to have a 100% redundancy solution. Now, I may also have dual exciters or dual drivers uh, in a single transmitter uh, as the exciter sometimes is the single point of failure and, and the most complex. But really, when we look at redundancy, it's important to evaluate uh, the cost for these uh, redundancies and your tolerance for risk because um, uh, it's all in essence insurance. So when we think of N plus one, a typical controller like this one that we have, we'll have some sort of front panel indicator, which gives you a simple signal flow of which transmitters are on the air, is the standby unit, uh, for example, into a dummy load, uh, that might be manual and auto switches. And then all of these, these are, you know, on the front panel, all that's typically shown up on a, a web GUI for remote operation. And if we think about how these might be connected from a redundancy standpoint, there's this third, uh, or overarching controller. So there's each individual transmitter. In this case shows four, a plus one transmitter, which is the backup and then a system controller. So uh, it, it has a RF, um, uh, program, transport stream and control logic between each of them to automatically monitor if there's a failure, to automatically reconfigure the RF switches and to put the backup transmitter on the air uh, and then provide you with some alarms. Now, the other thing I did want to mention, uh, we talked about redundancy was uh, the link redundancy. So in this case, a studio to transmitter links. Uh, so if we're using EDI, uh, one way to have redundancy is a technology we use in our interplex family called dynamic stream splicing. And this allows you to use multiple uh, commodity IP links to use not only for additional forward error correction, uh, but to be able to splice bits between multiple streams so that if you have interruption or packet loss on one stream, you can rebuild it with uh, complementary links on the other. So this hit list uh, protection is uh, quite powerful. I was mentioning uh, the ability to have multiple transmitters in a single or multiple ensembles in a single transmitter. So this is a unique product that Gates Air has. We can do up to three DAB uh, ensembles in the same transmitter. Uh, so, for example, this has three adjacent ones we can see in the RF um, uh, drawing here or capture of a monitor. Uh, advanced pre-correction allows us to do linear and nonlinear correction and use common amplifiers. So this is ideal if you're in, you have say three multiplexes, you want to put up a, a fill-in transmitter in a small area instead of having to put three transmitters in with RF combining with three sets of filters. Uh, you can simply have one single transmitter, take three ETI or EDI streams in and uh, transmit uh, the power out. So in this case, it can be as compact as one RU or we can do up to a kilowatt uh, or slightly higher in several RU. Uh, it uh, will work in DAB and, and I, uh, you know, or, or, or TDMB, basically the same modulation. Again, wideband Doherty amplifiers so are very efficient a GLONASH and GPS built in. So this is a unique way to cost effectively uh, add multiple uh, fill-in transmitters using only one transmitter. Now, the other approach of redundancy, which is a little unique, is this idea of having a one rack chassis with cards in it using a seven plus one or six plus two. Uh, so basically eight individual transmitters. And in this uh, 4RU chassis, uh, we have uh, all the N plus one switching, shared satellite receivers, shared GPS receivers, which are redundant by the way, uh, multiple power supplies uh, and the logic to do the switching. So, uh, you know, again, if you had an area where you needed some low power fill in 15 watts or so, but you had several ensembles, 
very cost effective way is to use a shared transmitter uh, like this multi channel transmitter. Uh, which uh, significantly reduces your cost to deploy. So some real advancements over where we were just a few years ago. So in summary, uh, there's a lot of options for DAV transmission networks that uh, weren't available not so long ago. Significant advancements in energy efficiency will help you drive down your long-term operating costs. Energy consumption uh, really can be impacted using liquid or air-cooled transmitters. Again, generally, if I have higher power transmitters, those are ideal. For liquid cooling helps me evacuate the heat outside and saves a lot on building cooling costs. If I have low power transmitters, uh, savings not so great uh, for liquid cooling uh, and the amount of heat put off is very low. So uh, the simplicity of air cooling generally wins out. There's a number of options for uh, cost effective redundancy, starting with you know redundancy in the transmitter itself with multiple power supplies, multiple PAs, a dual drive exciters, and then things like N plus one and one plus one switching. And then there've been some advancements in unique configurations, including, uh, you know, multi carriers on a single transmitter, as well as kind of a, a multi transmitter chassis system. All of these really designed to give you flexibility to cost effectively deploy your network. So uh, thank you so much uh, for your, um, your time and, uh, I think you'll find that as you evaluate transmitters moving forward, these advancements uh, make it even easier to cost effectively deploy DAB. Thank you very much. Okay. That was uh, Rich Redmond from Gates Air. Um, giving us all the latest on, on DAB transmitters. So um, I think the really exciting stuff there is, you know, the DOD transmission efficiency pushing up towards 45 to 50%, great improvement, and now multi-ensemble transmitters, certainly at lower powers, uh, and that will save a lot of money for multi-ensemble repeaters in particular. So uh, a lot of good news there, that's great. Let's now move straight on to, to coverage and interference planning, uh, and then we can uh, do some Q&A at the end. I, I see a couple of questions and I've got a couple from the other day as well. So uh, let's do that at the end. So now uh, on to coverage and interference planning. Okay, so we will go through requirements, uh, reference levels, network considerations, uh, single frequency network design and performance, uh, planning and interference aspects, and a couple of case studies. So of course, requirements come first. This is the an engineering approach, of course. Uh, so let's look, firstly look at high level requirements. <coughs> they are often, uh, imposed or required by the regulator uh, and vary between countries because different countries have you know, different requirements, different terrains, different population densities and so forth. But often there will be broad targets like 90% of the country area or 95% of the population. Uh, I could never see 90% 90 90 of Australia being covered, but certainly could see 90% of the UK. So again, it depends on the country. And there's also often other specific coverage requirements in terms of existing license area plans, uh, requirements to cover particular towns uh, of certain sizes, uh, roads of certain sizes, uh, radio you know, target audiences and so forth. Usually you, you want to do rollout to hit the highest population areas first, biggest bang for buck. In, in planning and allotment planning in particular, we really have to look at the, the amount of capacity needed. And that is both now and in the future. And uh, yeah, as we've found around the world, uh, when we switch to digital, we typically have um, between three and five times as many services. That is one of the key 
advantages of DAB and digital broadcasting is the ability to deliver more services, more content types, and man maintain that connection with the audience who are increasingly looking for niche type of uh, music in particular at different times. Or it might be politics, it, it could be news, it could be other things. And we typically dimension our ensembles for 64 kilobits per second per service at a FEC rate of EEP3A. -E now spectrum, the all important spectrum. Uh, if nothing else, you can't do anything if you haven't got any spectrum. Now, many countries have full access to VHF band three, which excluding channel 13 is 32 frequency blocks from 5A up to 12D. Um, and in Europe, for example, that is the case. All broadcast TV is in the UHF space. However, Europe also is a dense, uh, a continent of dense countries. So allowance has to be made for cross-border coordination. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, you might say, uh, example terms is Australia where VHF band three is used for digital television as well, as you can see in the diagram here. And we're only allocated eight DAB channels for the entire country. Um, and they need to, they, they sit in uh, blocks eight and nine or channel nine and nine A as we were called, called here. Uh, that creates its own problems in terms of planning because uh, the less frequencies you have, less frequency blocks available, the more complicated it is to plan the allotment planning to ensure minimum interference between areas with the same frequency block. Germany has access to all 32, and here's a good example of both multi-frequency and single frequency networks. We start with the national SFN, a single a single channel to cover the entire country in a one country-wide single frequency network. And gradually they're expanding to sub-national SFNs, uh, multi-frequencies, uh, networks to cover land out. And remember within each of these blocks, uh, you can see here in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, 11D, there will be a single frequency network within that frequency block. So, uh, and similarly, we have different land air coverage, and if all goes well at some time in the future, there could be up to six ensembles available all over Germany. That's huge, that's huge. Sure, they've got 85 million people, but that's also saying there could be of the order of 120 services available across the country with customization to each local area. Fantastic. Move on to reference field strength levels. So the current, um, most current guidelines for network planning, uh, EBU Tech 3391, that came out in uh, the middle of 2018. Uh, and within that document, uh, which I helped write actually, uh, there are three main reception modes. Uh, I, I exclude the handheld portable because it's it's not so widely used. The main ones used for uh, planning are actually mobile reception and portable indoor reception. And each of these has its specific characteristics in terms of channel models that are expected, in terms of antenna types, and what that means for required. Uh, less, we lost your sound. Uh, included things like location variation, as how signal is uh, an area, uh, mad made noise, uh, cities are much noisier than country, receiver antennas for different types of receivers, whether it's a portable or it's a car, and uh, quite importantly, building entry loss. And we find this is quite dependent on the on the country 
because countries with thicker walls and uh, uh, denser materials have a higher in-building entry loss. Uh, if it's made out of timber, you'll have much lower loss. If it's got lots of windows, probably much lower loss as long as you haven't got a metallic sheen. And if cars are okay, in-building performance is usually okay. And here's a table out of that 3391, and you can see all of the aspects which are included. We have uh, the uh, carry to noise ratio, we have all of the, the bandwidths and so forth. And I'll just point out a couple of uh, important aspects here. Uh, the first one is the antenna gain. And we see uh, mobile, which is cars, it's set at minus five dBD. Um, that in, a, in Australia, we don't go with that. Uh, we think that is far too high again. It's only applicable to cars which have external antennas, and many of the cars these days have in glass antennas which have much lower gain. Um, another one is man made noise. Uh, in Europe, we, they uh, ended up using man made noise level of 5.3, which is a lot higher than we use. We use two. Uh, it's building entry loss uh, 10 with a standard deviation of eight. Uh, that's close, we have a lower standard deviation. So what I'm saying here is that each country will consider some of these specific uh, parameters and adjust them for their own environment. And that ends up giving a bottom line down the bottom here, we see the minimum median equivalent field strength at 1.5 meters at 50% of the time, 50% of locations. For vehicles, they're saying 43 dB microvolts per meter. And for urban, 65. We can contrast that with the Australian planning field strengths, which for mobile outdoor, we have 50 because we did extensive testing and showed that uh, particularly for cars using in glass antennas, they tend to have poor gain and very uh, notchy horizontal radiation patterns. So we increased the gain requirement uh, considerably by about 6 dB, and you can see there that uh, we use 50 dB microvolts. Uh, and also in the urban grade, we use 60 as opposed to 65.7 uh, as recommended, and that's mainly due to man-made noise allowances um, and some, um, what was the other one, uh, entry loss differences. Uh, and we find that that suits our environment better. However, the, the, the key one here is the suburban, and we use that at 54 dB microvolts per meter, and that's what's used for planning for overspill and interference. Okay, let's look at network considerations now. High power, high tower versus low power, low tower. Uh, and I suppose there's a medium power in there somewhere as well, as you can see. Now, we always want to use high sites if we can, uh, and high power sites, because it actually minimizes the, the total cost of ownership or co total cost of deployment. Uh, Less sites means uh, uh, less lease fees, uh, particularly in cities where uh, the cost of leasing tower aperture uh, is very expensive. That is the primary driver in your operating cost, in fact, is the tower access. Not the electricity, that's about you know, less than 10%. Um, now, terrain is also the largest impact on coverage area. So we always have to watch out for not only hills, but large buildings or blocks of buildings, because they tend to throw RF shadows around. Uh, and obviously between the other side of the building from the transmitter itself. And that will then require, in some cases, <coughs> pardon, um, repeaters to cover that up, depending on whereabouts they are in the coverage area. So repeaters are generally low power, low tower, uh, and, and they can be quite cost effective, particularly in cities if you put them on top of buildings, 
uh, or find a, a, a local tower uh, that you could use. But note that Telco towers are often too low. What we want is a, a hill somewhere to put our a transmitter on or a repeater on. Now, site selection for cost optimization is time consuming, especially when you've got multiple repeaters in large cities. Uh, my tip is build the big one first, go and measure it. You can predict it, you have a good idea of where those issues will be, uh, go and measure it, and then you'll be able to work out what to do, whether it's a change in antenna pattern, uh, a change in power, if allowed, uh, or whether you have to put a repeater in. And of course, we have our single and multi frequency networks. Remember, if you've got different content on an ensemble, it must have a different frequency, otherwise, it will cause interference because uh, OFDM signals are pseudo noise signals. Um, once you've got a multi frequency network, you often find that to cover the area, you will need to use a single frequency network. And here's an example of that. If you've got a funny shape, uh, you can usually design a transmission plan that fits that shape quite well. But be careful, multiple low towers to make a nice accurate coverage is often a lot more expensive than a high tower and a couple of repeaters. Uh, and that's where you get into the arguments about overspill into adjacent license areas. And here's an example from uh, central New South Wales or New northern New South Wales. We can see, see Sydney down the bottom here. And each of these uh, areas is a different license area. Some of these overlap, they're different sizes. Um, some of these are small, they've got maybe 50 to 80 kilometres. Uh, some are several hundred kilometres across. So we need multiple transmitters to provide the coverage of the population centres and the roads and the wider areas where we can. All in a single frequency network. So let's talk about single frequency networks in a bit more detail. Uh, and here's the model from ETS 30799. It's the original model, it's like 20 years ago, and it's still applicable today. This was actually constructed for ETI distribution when we're using E1 circuits. Um, and you can see here the most critical aspect is the fact the ensemble multiplexer and the encoders in them in the exciters in the transmitters must be time locked to the same to the same source. I've used GPS here, but there's other 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 timing sources around. And we can see various different aspects going through here in terms of the transport, the network adapters, and so forth. So how is this controlled in time? You know, the launch time is actually encoded in the ETI stream in a timestamp. And that timestamp tells the transmitter when to transmit those frames. All transmitters must be time aligned, as we mentioned. Um, and there can be some adjustment on a transmitter transmitter basis. Uh, most transmitter implementations have an allowance for uh, further time delay at the output of the exciter. I, I thought I had another diagram on there, but never mind. Okay, so that, let's look at that time constraints. As we know in OFDM, we have a guard interval. That guard interval is to compensate for um, both multi-path distortion, you know, reflections off buildings, off mountains, uh, as well as multiple transmitters within an area. Uh, we have mode one. In fact, mode one is the only mode now in DAB. And a typical single frequency distance limit is 73.8 kilometers based on the uh, 246 microseconds of the guard interval. And once we have transmissions which are outside that guard interval, so they've say uh, 260 microseconds from uh, one another. And remember, this is at the receiver. So the receiver sees one transmission and another transmission is 260 microseconds away. It will cause interference. And this graph on the right indicates how much impact that interference will have. 
So we can demonstrate that here in this little diagram on the corner. And it's got minus 12 dB here. This is the co-channel interference protection ratio. And that is the limit uh, that you'll get before interference will occur. So if you have a, uh, a transmission and it's weaker than 12 dB down, but outside the guard interval, it generally won't make a great deal of difference. It will make a little bit of difference if it's like 13 or 14 or 15. Once you get down to 20, it will make no difference um, because it will be hidden in the noise floor and its power won't be sufficient to raise that noise floor much. However, if we have one that's up, it may be minus six, will cause significant interference and the amount of interference into the useful component will depend on um, the time difference. The further out, the more time, the more effect. And here's the diagram I was looking for, transport network, transmitter network, and sim single frequency network timing models. That's the standard terminology 20 years ago. Um, today, different manufacturers sometimes use their own terminology. And to be fair, this whole transport network is, is now been replaced by an IP network. Uh, so rather than all this padding and compensation, we end up with a delay and a jitter. We still have basically the same components with the trans within the transmitter, the processing delay, some compensation delay perhaps, and then there's the own, the transmitter's own offset delay, which we can use to adjust uh, interference points if needed. Let's talk about different types of repeaters. <coughs> we have link-fed repeaters, and they are, as it says, fed by a link, a microwave link or a telco link. And we have on-channel repeaters, which are fed off air. So they receive the RF signal, they amplify that, and they retransmit it. Uh, now, that's got its own problems. And usually to actually be able to build one of these, you have to minimise the coupling between the transmit and the receive antenna, and also usually provide some, some echo cancellation. And modern echo cancellers can typically cancel 10 times the signal power of the wanted. So if the main transmitter signal comes in at, at zero dBm, let's call it, into the on-channel repeater, uh, and the echo canceller can cancel echoes which are at plus 10 dBm. So very powerful signal processing is done to do that. Once you get beyond that, you start to get into stability issues. So let's look at a couple of examples. Um, On-channel repeaters typically at low power, less than a kilowatt, and only have issues if the field strength difference is less than the co-channel protection ratio, we use 12 dB, uh, and the time of, of arrival at the receiver between the two transmitters, we're only talking about two, is greater than 264 microseconds. And there's the equations that you can use to calculate that. Now, with OCRs, if that OCR is within 34 kilometres of the main transmitter, you don't have any issues. It's only if it's further away. And I'll show you uh, an example of why in a minute. And in fact, here it is right here. So in this example, I've used a 50 kilowatt transmitter for main and a 70 kilometre as a way, we've got one kilowatt repeater. And even though that's very close to the boundary of 73, there still can be issues because the received signal has to be amplified and then retransmitted back inside. Uh, Les, we lost your sound momentarily. Like the man. Okay. Two hundred and forty-six microsecond. So in this case, the signal out in the repeater gets to the point that it's stronger than the within twelve dB of the, the main with within the area 
of interference, which is when this 246 microseconds can be violated, which is to the left of this number here, which in this case is about 35 kilometers, halfway or so. Because the signal from the main transmitter is much stronger than the signal by the repeater. However, if we have a shadowed zone in the main coverage area, which shadows the main transmitter power by let's say 20 dB in this case, uh, the signal from the, the repeater can creep into that 12 dB range and cause a local area of interference in this shadow zone. So what this says is when you're designing networks with on-channel repeaters, which are cheaper to operate than link-fed repeaters, and often cheaper to implement uh, because of the microwave links themselves, we always have to make sure that we understand the impact of shadow zones. Now, the same sort of thing applies to link-fed repeaters. And there's the equations again. Uh, and we've got another example here. I've actually put a 50 and a 10 kilowatt transmitter 130 kilometers away. So, well, that's way over 73. It's almost double. However, because of this relationship between um, the both the time and the protection required, even in this case on a flat ground using the propagation model I've used here, there isn't a problem. But again, if I put a shadow zone in, I also find there's an area where there's danger of interference. And remember, it's all relative. You know, the the more signal power, if it's zero, equal power for out of uh, equal power for each of the transmissions, but outside, well outside the guard interval, it will virtually destroy the signal. But if it's down now 10, 12 dB, it will have some impact, but not totally destroy it. So again, it's one of these things where I always recommend once you've built your main transmitter, you go and measure these these areas because you'll you'll know where they are because of your modeling. So moving on to interference. So this is what we really need to look at when we're doing both allotment planning and implementation planning. Allotment planning can often be done using reference models and standard transmission uh, powers. In this country, we used, in Australia, we used five kilowatts when we knew that there's many, many areas that are going to need you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 kilowatts. But to get the allotment right, we just used a reference model. So what we want, we want to know the maximum allowable interference field strength in the area. And that is calculated uh, given the a range of parameters, but most importantly, the co-channel protection ratio we've been talking about, which is that 12 dB or the rally fading carry to noise ratio. And this is an ongoing problem. You can plan, plan and get the, uh, get your frequency allotment, your frequency block allocated. When you go to get a higher frequency, you then have to go back and check the interference into other license areas using the same frequency, same frequency block. And often that will require adjustments to antenna patterns to protect those other areas. And also uh, cross-border coordination, which is basically the same, same issue. It just happens to be you're dealing with another country for that interference rather than another license area within your own country. And it can include <coughs> button, interference into digital TV as well. And that has a different protection ratio. So case studies. Um, first, uh, Sydney, we can see the uh, Artaman transmission here. It's a 45 kilowatt main transmission. It's virtually circular uh, and it gets about 30 kilometers. Uh, you can see the, the coverage requirement here in white. That's the license area. So we can see the west of Sydney only has road level coverage, vehicle level coverage, uh, which Sometimes you get these bits of brown, you get some indoor. Uh, sometimes even vehicle level coverage is good enough for indoor if the, the window, for example, is facing the transmitter. 
So we need uh, five, in fact, six repeaters. These are the five. We have these yellow ones, which are close to the transmitter, which are linked, uh, which are on channel repeaters. And the ones at your distance out here in the north, uh, northwest and southwest, they are link fed repeaters. They're relatively low power. Now we see here, actually, um, that there is still a gap here in the middle of the west. Uh, we're building a, a new airport, uh, and that's going to have to be fixed at some point uh, because the population there is going to increase quite uh, very quickly uh, in the next five years as that airport comes up and a whole lot of new features and infrastructure and suburbia is established. Now, that might be fixed by increasing the powers of this Winmer Lee and Mount Pajeli transmission, or it might be a new repeater in that area itself. And here is an example of the terrain issue in the northern beaches. So that's up here in Newport. And we can see there's a bowl which provides shadowing of the main signal. All these yellow areas are just road, road level, and we want to provide them with urban grade. And we do that by putting a repeater up here at Newport on, on the hill here. Uh, it's 300 watts, and it projects the majority of its power down into this bowl. And you can see yellow has turned to green, and that's just what we like. Same sort of thing happened in Melbourne, uh, where in this case, uh, the shadowing was not from the terrain, it was from the city itself. And you can see here this area to the west, uh, which had heavy shadowing and required a repeater to fill that in. Uh, and similarly, in single frequency networks, uh, if we want to get best for bang for buck, we'll cover the main population centres and the main roads. And here's an example from Sale in Victoria, where we've got quite a linear type of uh, coverage system where we've got uh, and it's relatively low and undulating, and we've got transmitters here, five kilowatt main in this area, and then a number of one kilowatt single frequency transmitters uh, along the road itself. So a whole range of different ways we can solve these things. Uh, conclusions, well, um, I think I've sort of said all these things, so we'll leave it to that. Uh, but there, uh, that's uh, an overview of coverage and interference planning, and I hope that's been useful for you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Now, let's move on to the next and last topic of the day before we try and do a couple of quick questions, and that is the Asia Pacific Technical Group. Well, DAB is establishing this technical group to assist uh, all stakeholders in the Asia Pacific region to help them establish DAB. Uh, and it covers quite a wide range of topics. So you can see here the purpose. And this group will offer participants the opportunity to discuss, learn, and collaborate on technical aspects of digital radio, the information being tailored specifically to regions where necessary. Um, and this is the sort of topics that we are thinking of covering. Uh, RF coverage planning, interference, coordination, uh, technical business cases, rollout strategies, multiplexing, um, DAB features, hybrid radio receivers, and frankly, any topics uh, and specific areas of interest. Now, membership of this group is free. Membership is open to all stakeholders in the radio broadcasting ecosystem who want to uh, establish DAB. Uh, we're planning on somewhere between two and four meetings a year, but if it's if there's hot topics and we need to do more activities we will. And that will generally be virtual, and we know all, know all about virtual meetings these days, but we try to do at least one face-to-face -face meeting a year, and that might be, for example, uh, during the ABU Digital Broadcasting Summit in Kuala Lumpur. And we'll discuss specific topics, uh, ongoing projects, uh, new areas of interest, uh, and we can have guest presentations on, on particularly hot topics uh, and so forth. So the first meeting is scheduled for Wednesday the 2nd of December um, and if you want to be involved in that group we've already sent out a number of invitations 
However, if you didn't get one and you want to be involved, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And you can contact Bernie O'Neill, who's the director uh, at the project office at WorldDeb, or myself on the email. And I look forward to uh, many of your company at our first meeting. I think it should be a, a very, very useful group to help uh, this area, uh, the Asia Pacific area, move forward. So on that note, uh, I'm going to move on to uh, some Q and A, uh, and we've had a couple of uh, of questions uh, that I will now answer. Uh, thanks for that, Shreem. Um So um, the first question I've got here is from Alan, uh, and Alan's referring to uh, a tech report 51. Uh, about uh, field testing, I think it is, um, and that report from the EBU was released, uh, let me have a look, uh, April this year, and it provides a whole range of, of uh, methods and activities to measure your coverage. I have had a look at this. In general, it's it's pretty good, um, and I actually recommend, absolutely recommend, field testing of your coverage, particularly in the early days. It's very important that the engineering team has a very good understanding of the coverage which is delivered, and when expanding uh, using propagation prediction tools, how that uh, how accurate those predictions are likely to be. So I'd recommend the EBU uh, um, documentation. Uh, he also men mentions 3D topographic maps. Well, we use that all the time. Uh, that is typically used in the planning tools uh, that are generally used, uh, where we have digital terrain maps, typically to about 20 meter pixel resolution. And on top of that, we have clutter maps, which are building maps and types of building maps, or uh, uh, and also forest and open areas, all of that business. So all good stuff. Um, next one is, what are the technical parameters I need to consider to make good planning for DAB systems? So I think I've sort of run through most of this already, uh, but I'd just say the following, uh, you know, in a sort of a short, short sharp way establish your coverage reference levels which i talked about earlier in this presentation for your country um, do your allotment planning uh, to establish a roadmap and and given the number of services in each area um, particularly taking into account the fact that you're likely to have a three to five time increase in the number of services or stations in each area. Agree your protection ratios for, particularly for co-channel interference. Use good prediction, that's essential. If you, you don't use good prediction, you can end up paying a very high price. Either you get, get it wrong and you have too low powers, so you then have to put too many repeaters or rebuy uh, transmitters, or you go too high and you pay too much money. Either way, you're spending a lot more time and effort that could have been um, uh, not needed if you'd done it right the first time. Uh, note the different areas and different terrains uh, will be slightly different, even when you optimise your, your prediction models uh, and tune them to a particular field test set of measurements. Uh, so while you'll get more confidence as you go on, um, Ongoing testing of new areas is a is a sensible thing to do. Okay, and a, and a couple of other questions. Uh, now I had one from yesterday. Ah, okay. What will be the cost of professional training of technicians and engineers in radio stations for the transition from analog to DAB skills? Well, <coughs> pardon me. There's two main ways to do this. The first way is WorldDAB 
provide significant support to DAB Plus stakeholders in the form of documentation, standards, events and activities. And if you become a World DAB member or your, um, your broadcasters or set of broadcasters in an area become members, you then get access to much more detailed materials and very uh, importantly, the ETI library for equipment testing and interoperability. And of course, um, World Dab you know, does many workshops and, and webinars like this to help educate. But if you want to get down to the, the real hands-on stuff, you might need to engage a subject matter, subject matter expert to provide that sort of training and assistance. Uh, that is uh, quite commonly done. Um, another one is, is there a slide info on countrywide coverage geographically, remote areas from main cities? Um, okay, I'll share my webcam for the end. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, well, it depends on the country. Uh, in Europe, uh, countries are smaller. The areas are ten, tend to be smaller, so the tendency is for full or nearly full area coverage of the entire country. Uh, and I mentioned numbers like 90 and 90 plus percent of the country. In large countries like Australia, this is much more problematic and it certainly won't have full DAB, DAB coverage in this country. But what I would say is we'd probably target something like maybe 90 percent of the population, even though that might only be 30 to 40 percent of the area. So yes, AM is still important in those uh, in those distant areas at this point in time. And one final question I'll just ask: What do you have a percentage for DAB implementation worldwide? Um, well, not specifically, but we can work it out roughly, uh, knowing that DAB about five hundred and thirty million people worldwide can now receive DAB and DAB plus. And that's out of whatever the current world population is, somewhere over 7 billion. So it's a reasonable percentage. Uh, the important point is, is it's going up all the time. Uh, we have that. Those numbers are uh, a lot of Europe, of obviously Australia, uh, now the Middle East and Northern Africa, uh, South Africa. Uh, but the Asia Pacific is really uh, a, a big area with a lot of people. Uh, which will eventually also have DAB. So uh, with that, I think I'd like to uh, sign off for today. Mm, yeah, I think um, yeah, we don't see any other question. Uh, you have found this yeah, webinar series useful. Yeah, let's keep a um, minute more. Uh, all comments and feedback uh, yeah. uh, are very valuable to us because what we want to do at, you know, at World DAB and what I want to do personally with my business is to ensure the best possible education on DAB across broadcasters, all broadcasters. We want to make this work. We want to make it work for the listeners uh, and you know, remain in uh, the digital world. We need to come into the digital world uh, where we've got, still got analog radio. Um, so if you've got any suggestions for improvements, any extra topics you'd like covered, uh, or have any questions whatsoever, please send them to the email addresses I mentioned before. And you'll, if you haven't already written them down, you'll be able to get copies of all the presentations and the videos of these webinar sessions uh, in a few days' time once we've assembled all the information. And all, all participants uh, through, the, through the ABU website will receive a link to, to that information that you can download and then review and come back to World Dab and ABU at your leisure. I'd like to thank all of the all of the participants, the presenters, for their excellent material and their effort and time. And most importantly, uh, I'd like to thank you, the audience, uh, for your, taking the time to to listen and hopefully to learn um, about DAB and take it forward in your country. So with that, uh, oh, and one more thing, I would like to, a great big thanks to the ABU for hosting this, uh, in particular to Nadine, the technical director, and very importantly to Shri, who's been the facilitator of this series uh, throughout the last three days, 
and has done a fantastic job. So great. Thank you very much to the to the ABU team, and thank yeah, you very much yeah. to the audience. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, I'll sign off now. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Good night. Uh, thank you, Des. I think uh, you hear us, uh, and then there was a really interesting series that we had. Um, and uh, okay, with that, uh, we've come to the end of the webinar series. Um, so uh, let's uh, go uh, for closing up the webinar uh, for today. So thank you very much for your participation, and we're ending the webinar. Um, if you are in uh, World Day webinar series here. Thank you. We'll look forward to seeing you in some other event. Thank you very much.